And we already have our next presenter ready for us. It is Magistra Yitka Fernandez Lopez from the Czech Republic. She is the Feng Shui consultant, member of College of Feng Shui, midwife, and uh, part of Nursing and Midwifery Council in the United Kingdom, also European College of Feng Shui again. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your interest in Feng Shui by coming to hear my presentation. Uh, I would like to attempt today to bring you closer the idea of Feng Shui uh, by explaining you a little bit its origins, where it comes from, and uh, also hopefully giving you a little bit of uh, tips and tricks that you can take home today and uh, if you want to implement in your own home. <clears throat> so, at the beginning, I would like to start with a little story. Uh, thousands of years ago, so when our civilization was in its infancy and uh, the way we were living was very different to as we know it now, uh, the humanity uh, had to look after themselves in a very different way. Uh, we were living in little villages and in little settlements, and we were dependent on each other, but also on observation and understanding of the nature. And these very times are the very starting points of Feng Shui. Uh, when people lived in small settlements, they started to observe little nuances between those settlements. They started to notice that there are places where uh, the people living in the village are healthier, they are having more children, they are able to grow more crop, and they are generally being happier and doing better. And over the time, they uh, observed few um, points and few aspects that they felt might have an influence on this. So they started to pass this knowledge that was at the beginning collected only verbally onto the next and next generations, and over the centuries were developing this knowledge and started to write it down. Uh, the first written artifacts about Feng Shui as we know it today are from about 2,000 years ago. And that's when the system has actually developed and started to develop different ways and schools as we know it today. Um, I would like to show at the beginning uh, in a brief explanation what actually is Feng Shui, how we understand it today. So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a teaching or a system that is based on the observation of the nature and how it influences us as humans, what impact it has on our lives in many different ways. Um, it's a combination of science, because it works with mathematical principles, with principles of physics, metaphysics, astrology, and it combines a lot of knowledge together about which we've already heard over this amazing weekend. Um, and uh, it's partially also philosophy and partially art. There is a tiny bit of a feng shui which we call um, basically superstition. And that's just basically because uh, this teaching comes from South China, and the Chinese way of thinking is very different to our Western way of thinking. We are very analytical people, while Chinese are um, more, using, uh, meta uh, more using metaphors and uh, understanding the relationships between things, rather than looking at things in a black and white way. So, uh, we couldn't translate all the old texts that were available, and we had to partially work with our own Western understanding of things. Uh, feng Shui, in translation, means a wind and water, and those two elements are very significant in this teaching uh, because they represent their own, um, th their own um, abilities to, uh, one is to move energy, to move potential, and the other one is to contain it. So, altogether, in a short word, it's, uh, it's a system uh, that includes a lot of different relationships to other teachings and um, other arts and science, uh, and that helps us to work with our own environment. Because we know that the environment itself has a big influence on us as humans. Um, you've already heard in some uh, presentations here about elements. Feng Shui also works with elements um, in a slightly uh, different way. There are five of them uh, that are uh, earth, 
water, metal, fire and wood. And those elements are used when we work with people's environment and when we're trying to bring a balance and harmony into it. Uh, these elements have six different relationships between them and uh, depending on those relationships we um, use them to either introduce them in people's environment or perhaps eliminate them um, again in order to bring that balance. Uh, the other term you might be familiar with is a term chi and um, Many people think that chi is something magical or mystical and something energy-based, but the literal translation for, from the old text is actually that chi is a potentially uh, of the matter to become while remaining in its original state. So in other words, um, we are here in this beautiful hall and this hall, depending what we use it for, has a potential to become a dancing hall, to become a congress hall, to become a meeting hall for discussions. So we are not really physically changing the environment, but we are using its potential that's within it. Um, the main thing in Feng Shui is that it focuses on the human beings. They have always been the core uh, and in the center of the attention of Feng Shui, because as I mentioned at the beginning, it was all about relationships with nature and the environment and its impact it has on us humans. Um, how the Feng Shui relates to our health? Well, I'll give you a simple example. Um, it's something you can try yourself. It's a brilliant little uh, trick to try when you go to a restaurant or a coffee shop. Uh, if you observe people or if you look at the statistics, when we go to the public places uh, where there are options where we naturally seat ourselves, the first places that tends to be taken over are the ones by the windows or walls. And usually it's the tables in the middle of the coffee shops uh, that are surrounded by all the other people and tables that tends to be empty till the last minute. Very, very few people will naturally first sit in the middle of an empty room. And again, that comes from that very core of Feng Shui, from those very beginnings, when we were much more tuned in the nature. And we needed to understand that we had to have control of our environment because there was a potential danger when we were living outside and uh, that we needed some kind of a security. And I will relate this to one of my latest slides and explain you how that interprets into our modern living environments. Um, so, one of the questions I get asked a lot is why people ask Feng Shui consultants to do the analysis for them. Well, there are a lot of different reasons really, and it is based on individual people, but I picked just a few I get asked most of the times. Um, most commonly, because Feng Shui is about that relationship, it's also about relationships amongst humans. So quite often people come in situations in life when they have a struggle with something, whether it's a struggle in a marriage, going through a divorce, looking for a new partner, uh, supporting family, children, they want them to be doing better at school, Sometimes it's when they don't feel uh, material security. Uh, they are, for example, setting up their own business. They are trying to do better at work or find their passion in life. Sometimes they come because they have health issues and they try to adjust their environment the way that it supports them better so they can recover better. So there's really a lot of different reasons why um, or how Feng Shui could actually help people. We are also using Feng Shui to do uh, things such as a garden design or working with the land that's been untouched, for example, for building new houses, but also for building cities. And uh, there is... Uh, some of you might be familiar with the saying, what was first, a hen or an egg? And in Feng Shui, there is something similar, uh, and it relates to all the capital cities around the globe. And the question sounds, uh, where there first the capital city is, and they were set there, where they stand now as we know them, because that area ticked all the boxes for a good Feng Shui, or did people... Uh, put somewhere a city, not thinking in the long-term future that it will become a capital, and it became capital because of all the supportive energies. We don't know the answer. We just know that if you want to do your own research and you look at the, um, all the capitals around the globe, and you look at the Paris, Prague, New York, um, 
you will notice uh, two important things. One, they tend to sit either in a little valley or beginning of a mountain, or they have other hills somehow, one way or another, surrounding them. And two, there is always a wat water body. There's always a river or an ocean. And those two aspects in the landscape, in the terrain, are really important in Feng Shui, and they are called water and mountain dragons. And when we work with the new builds and gardens and designing whole cities, these are the reference points that we actually use. I prepared a little quiz for you. Uh, again, just it was really hard to pick a few bits and bobs, uh, but these are kind of a myths that I would like to either confirm or exclude today, what people generally think. So one of the things I get quite often asked is, does a mirror belong to the bedroom? Is it going to destroy my relationship? What do you think is the answer? Does anyone wants to have a guess? It's a no. <laughs> That's what a lot of people think. Actually, mirrors are absolutely fine in the bedroom. They just there are some rules that we should follow where we place them. And one of them is it should not be facing directly your own bed and reflect you sleeping. But they are absolutely fine in the bedroom. I have a mirror in my bedroom all my life and I never a problem. <laughs> How about bed, the actual bed in the bedroom? Some people think it should be at that center and to be in that control position. Some people think it should be more onto the side or in the middle of the room. Any ideas? Anyone wants to have a guess? Yeah, more than fresh air arms, yes. Generally, good ventilation is a good feng shui. But the beds generally should be not quite dead center, just ever so slightly off, but there should be space on both sides. And I will soon link why two sides should be free and at least being able to just walk around. WC, men or women, constant fight, sit up, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> can hear women saying, down, <laughs> down. <laughs> yes, it's not just the seat, it's the actual cover as well. So uh, in the Chinese thinking, obviously toilet and the bathroom itself is, relates to a dirty area, uh, but not dirty area necessarily in a physical way, but also where the negative energy leaves the house. So you don't want it to come back and you don't want also the good energy to follow. So the seat down, sorry gentlemen, the women are right, should be down, the cover as well. Uh, that brings me to the next one, uh, which is the door to the bedroom, uh, bathroom. Open or closed, or it's okay? Closed. Uh, generally speaking, yes, ideally. Now, we all know that uh, we, we are not all lucky to live in a mansion where the bathroom itself is massive and has three own windows. So wherever possible, the, bedroom, the bathroom door should be closed, but uh, it's in the situations where there is a window that can be open. So again, we're coming back to that ventilation, as the gentleman uh, mentioned. Where it's not possible and it's needed for ventilation purposes, then of course it's absolutely fine to keep the door open for as long as it's needed with the toilet seat and cover down, and then close it when it's not needed. Okay, let's move on. Now, uh, the bins by the entrance door, I put this because I work for a long time in the UK and uh, if you're familiar with the UK architecture, there are um, these houses that are connected with each other and they each have allocated set of bins for normal waste and recycling. And there is physically no space where else to put it in right in front of your main door in many cases. But at the same time, to have bins by the main door, which is really important area for your in Feng Shui perspective, for your career, for example, uh, it's a no way. So where do we stand? What do we do with our bins? <laughs> yes. So yeah, the answer is ideally no by the entrance door. Unfortunately, the situations often are not ideal. We don't have any other option, basically. It's a line houses and there's nowhere else to put them. So uh, we usually try to work with aesthetics as well. There is always some little, maybe like timber or bamboo shading we can put in front of them. We can decorate them with the stickers, do something that um, kind of improves the environment and doesn't catch the attention in the negative way, basically. But if you have the option, don't put them by your main door. Uh, next thing I get asked a lot is about, uh, because these days we talk a lot about the plastic pollution and about you know, having busy lives at the same time wanting to have a bit of nature in our homes. So where do we stand with plants and flowers and things like that in our household? Are artificial flowers okay or should they always be the real? 
Any thoughts on that? Uh, no, real, yes. It is the ideal solution. Real flowers and plants are the ones that are ideal. But um, unfortunately, again, it's not always possible if we travel a lot. So if we can at least have some uh, just to lighten the environment, it's okay too. And I'll just skip the next question. Yes, it is possible. We, for all the animal lovers, we can actually do and do calculations of feng shui for our lovely pets. I'll just show you a couple of uh, examples. This is kind of a before and after uh, from some of my clients uh, that came with different um, issues in their lives and uh, how the elements and the feeling in the rooms have changed uh, when we implemented the changes. Sometimes the change is really small, sometimes it's quite big, sometimes it's a problem with the space that is might be really small. So it's just a quick example of some work that was done based on Feng Shui principles. Um, I know I have to finish, so just very quickly. Um, at the beginning, I mentioned about our environment and about a connection uh, to the security and other uh, disciplines. And uh, the diagram I'm just showing you now actually relates uh, to those. And it talks about the points of reference that we look at uh, in the landscape, but that we look at in our homes as well. And if we can find those points of reference and work with them, uh, we can reach good balance between the yin and yang, and we we can find the balance that will support us on the physical way and emotional and physical way as well. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Fernandez Lopez. Um, she, Mrs. Lopez was talking about uh, the Western way of thinking and the Eastern way of thinking and how much we don't know and how much we still have to learn. And Mrs. Fernandez told us about Feng Shui and how to apply it in our lives uh, because everything is about balance and the flow. And the balance and the flow um, is important to be added to our living environment in order to... Um, reflected into our lives.